Let's go. Looks like we've got pretty much everybody here. Let's just get started with our material for the day. Let me just dig in here. Um, all right, so we are almost but not quite done with the chemistry review. So we're gonna just say chem review. Um, conclusion. All right, so last time, you know, because we obviously we don't have a warm up today because we have a big quiz. It doesn't be kind of silly to have a warm up. Um, but just to review, like a protein, what are the different levels of structure of a protein? Primary. There's primary, and what is primary structure of a protein? Just how they're connected, the order that they go. And what are the they's? Amino acids. Exactly. So the, this is just which amino acid is connected to which amino acid in what order. You know, basically the DNA blueprint is specifying this for the most part. And then what's the next level of structure we see in a protein? Secondary. Uh, secondary. And what is secondary? That's where you get the like um, alpha helix and the beta pleated sheets where they start folding in and creating some hydrogen bonds. Exactly, you get the hydrogen bonding that creates these helices, these kind of spirals and these big flat things. And again, this is all gonna come up a little later this week as we start talking about what does it actually mean for like a receptor to bind a neurotransmitter and stuff, you actually need, do need to think about what a protein is and how it's put together. What about, what is the tertiary structure? When those two are combined. And there's, there's kind of more to it. There's hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions. You know, there's hydrophobic, hydrophilic, things kind of fold in and out. Um, there's often like kind of other kinds of bonding like disulfide bridges. So you get this kind of more complicated folded structure. And most, a lot of proteins are functional at this point. Um, and like I mentioned, proteins have thousands, tens of thousands of amino acids. These are big complicated things. Um, and then we've talked about the optional quaternary structure. What is quaternary structure? Secondary and tertiary together. Um, that's kind of unclear. Is it, is it uh, two or more uh, tertiary sub subunits? Exactly. That was two or more tertiary structures that act as subunits to make the functional protein. So, like hemoglobin or antibodies? Exactly, hemoglobin, antibodies, myosin, there's a bunch of proteins that act as, um, or that have subunits that you have to assemble to make the functional protein. So that's, that's that, proteins, again, pro and remember the amino acids, every amino acid as a side chain and the side chain can have different properties. Some of them are going to be nonpolar or polar or make positive ionic bonds or negative ionic bonds. So the different kinds of amino acids like to have different kinds of chemical bonding interactions and that's gonna be important too as we go along, particularly in this idea of binding. Um, so it's important to remember that the amino acids aren't just like little doohickeys. They're actually functionally different from each other in terms of what kind of chemical interactions they like to participate in. All right.
The only thing that we haven't really covered are the nucleic acids, nucleotide based things. Um, you know, for the purposes of this class, we're not going to use, you know, obviously there's DNA, you know, deoxyribonucleic acid, RNA. You know, what are the main base pairs you find making up DNA? A, T, C, and G. Yeah, there's the adenosine, which base pairs with the thymine, the guanine, which base pairs with the cytosine. RNA, how is RNA a little different? Is the uracil. Yeah, A is a uracil instead of a thymine. It's also, remember, the R ribonucleic, it has ribose instead of deoxyribose which is, and again, remember ribose was just a pentose sugar, a five carbon sugar. Um, also RNA is single stranded. RNA is much less stable. Like DNA is pretty stable, like right a crime scene. They go to the crime scene and they find some white blood cells and they can extract the DNA and do some DNA fingerprinting because the DNA still has information in it. RNA, if you're if you're in a lab and you're working with RNA, you need to be super careful because just like the oil on your fingers will destroy it. So this this is more you know making temporary copies of things, whereas this is much more stable. Um, for our class, you know you should know that these are used to carry you know preserve and carry and transfer genetic material, but we're not going to go into that much. Um, the things that are related that you need to know, we've already talked about ATP, right? That's the same A, the adenosine, and you throw on a few phosphates, and now you've got ATP, the currency energy, which we've, uh, hopefully this looks super familiar, both in terms of what it looks like and what it does. You know, we talked about it stores energy, you break that bond there and you can release energy to use to in other things. Um, I don't know if I mentioned that endergonic reactions versus exergonic. These give off energy, these release energy. For instance, this thing, if you're going ATP, going to ADP plus phosphate, that is an exergonic reaction, something that releases energy. Endergonic is something that requires energy to run. You know, so these are often coupled. Specifically, you know, particularly with ATP. Very often the breakdown of ATP is going to be um, specifically coupled to some other reaction that normally wouldn't run on its own. Um, and it is using the energy of breaking apart ATP to do something that wouldn't happen that requires energy. We'll see that a bunch. So ATP is going to be kind of a star player through the semester. Um, other things that you've, we've talked about, but I'll kind of redo. We talked about NADH and FADH2. These are my these are my kind of little high energy electron carriers. We're going to see these playing key roles in cellular respiration. The basic idea here is NAD plus plus two electrons, you know, plus you two plus actually one hydrogen plus an H plus becomes NADH, and in the, in this reduced form, this is holding on to high energy electrons. If you see NADH you're thinking there's a molecule that's got a lot of potential energy. 
you know, lots of potential energy in this thing. And then, you know, when it goes the other way and it gives up, releases those electrons, those electrons can be received by something. And as they are handed off, the energy that is released as the electrons go from their high energy configuration to a lower energy configuration can then be used to do work. So we'll be seeing that as a, you know, integral part of cellular respiration is handing off high energy electrons to other molecules that are gonna, again, the metaphor of, or simile, the simile, it's like lifting something up against gravity and then handing it off to a lower and lower um, level, right? So the energy, the electrons in NADH are held way up high and you hand it off down to a lower thing and as they fall, so to speak, that energy can be used to do work. So we'll see these dudes. And FADH is that, you know, these are basically functionally similar. Don't worry about the differences. They're, they're basically the same idea. They both carry electrons that they can then give. Now, these are the things that um, you make from, you know, your classic B vitamins. Remember, niacin and riboflavin. Those are the precursors that you need to make NADH and FADH2. You know, so when you're thinking of like, oh, fortified with riboflavin and niacin, it's just these dudes that you need to run your chemical reactions and cellular respiration. Um, and then finally, the other major players that are related to the nucleic acids are, there's cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP. Um, this is mono. So this is adenosine. So cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And this one here is cyclic guanosine monophosphate. You know, just from their name, it's going to have the A or the G, the nucleotide base, and one phosphate group. And the cyclic means that it's connected up in this circle in terms of its chemical form. The main thing you need to know about these, these are important molecules in signal transduction. So cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP, these are signaling molecules. You know, the only reason you can see me talking to you on your screen is that the light that hits your retina, your rods and cones, starts a chain reaction in those cells that is intimately related to cyclic GMP that ultimately re re results in nerve signals to your brain and to your optic, you know, to your um, visual cortex, right? So if you didn't have, you know, cyclic GMP is at the core of how your rods and cones turn light into nervous system impulses. We're going to see both cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP a bunch. And again, these are not about storing energy. These are about carrying messages. So, so that's that. So at this point, we have talked about carbs. We've talked about lipids. We've talked about proteins. Talked about nucleic acids and their family. Um, and then there's a bunch of stuff that is just mixes of them, right? If you, in fact, we're going to see a lot of things that are proteins. You can have a protein, but then throw on some sugar groups. 
if you have a protein that has sugar groups on it, we call it a glycoprotein. So there's some carbs on there, but it's mainly a it's mainly a protein, but it's got some you know glyco means sugar. It means basically a sugar coated protein. Like most of the cell membrane proteins actually have these carbohydrate groups hanging off of there. Um, if you have something that's primarily a carbohydrate, but then also has protein groups on it. We call it a proteoglycan, right? So that's got, you know, they're, they're, they're both a mashup between a protein and a carbohydrate, but glycoproteins are mainly protein with sugar groups. Proteoglycans are more carbohydrate with amino acids, like peptides hanging off of it. What about if I have a protein and I have some lipids attached to it. What am I going to call that? Or actually, we're going to see this a lot. You'll have a protein and there'll be lipids. It's going to be a lipoprotein. Lipoproteins are actually the ways that lipids get carried around in your body, like in your bloodstream, right? We talked about lipids being hydrophobic. They don't dissolve in water. They won't dissolve in your plasma. So you take the lipid, but then you surround it with a whole bunch of protein. And so this lipoprotein, this thing will dissolve in water because, you know, this is all polar. And it's basically like a little cargo, cargo container to move lipids around through your bloodstream. So lipoproteins are going to be super important as we go through the semester. So just kind of putting that out there, like there's, there's lots of different versions of different things. Um, what cell organelle does a lot of this kind of like if I'm making a glycoprotein or a lipoprotein, what cell organelles do a lot of the post-translational processing of stuff? Kind of the little assembly line. If you're like in a cell, you know, if I wish it, you know, if I'm in a cell, where, where, where are proteins made? Ribosome. The RFER. Exactly. So those ribosomes. And ribosomes can either be free ribosomes, or then you also have someone was saying the rough ER. And the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Remember, endoplasmic reticulum is just the big membranous organelle, lots of channels and places full of membranes, and you can actually just make the protein and thread it directly into the ER. So if you are making proteins on the ribosome on the rough ER, they basically get automatically put into the system of membranous channels as they're being produced. Um, and then there's another membranous organelle that is where kind of once you make the protein, where you do a lot of this post-translational processing. What is, usually it's like membranes that are kind of more kind of set up kind of like pancakes. Things are taken and they're moved from one to the next and each of the next set of these membranous um, structures have different kinds of enzymes that will do more of the processing to create the final, the final molecule. What do we call the organelle where you're adding in, you're kind of moving things from one membranous chamber to the next to kind of create and produce and package and trans move things around? Golgi apparatus? Yeah, totally, the Golgi apparatus. Right, so you, know, you should, I am assuming, like on an exam, I would assume you know the basics of you know, the organelles in a cell. 
you know, endoplasmic reticulum, the roughy R that's studded with ribosomes where you make stuff that gets put in there. There's also smooth ER. Smooth ER tends to not have all the ribosomes. It's usually more having enzymes that are anchored in the membrane. It's more for processing stuff rather than kind of storing and transporting stuff. Um, what do we call the little organelles where cellular respiration happens? Mitochondria. Yeah, the mitochondria, right? The mitochondria. We are going to spend a lot of time looking at mitochondria. Like so far, you know, I am assuming that you know mitochondria is where cellular respiration happens and where the majority of the ATP is being made. You know, they always say the powerhouse of the cell. But before the next couple of weeks are out, you are going to know in a lot more detail what's going on in here if you haven't been looking at it closely before. We'll probably spend an entire day just looking at all the processes going on in the mitochondria to, you know, accomplish cellular respiration and churn out all that ATP. Um, what else? What are other organelles that are important? Lysosomes? Yeah, totally, lysosomes. What is a lysosome? Peroxisomes, but they're different. Yeah, so they're different. Peroxisomes plays kind of a similar role. What, what is the role of a lysosome? They have digestive enzymes and um, digest unwanted substances. Yeah, exactly. So it's filled with, with enzymes that break stuff down. So if you have something that you're trying to get rid of, you can have some little membranous vesicle filled with whatever. And you can just fuse the membranes. And now the digestive enzymes will help break this down. Right, cells are constantly, you know, recycling stuff, digesting things, where things wear out and they have to get recycled or they eat something that they have to break down and get rid of. So it's, but it takes constant energy to actually keep these intact. You know, we, we're not gonna get that into it, but you should definitely know this word apoptosis. It's kind of like programmed cell death. Like when a cell is gonna die, it doesn't just die and fall apart. Because if it did, it'd be really bad. You know, your lysosomes would be releasing digestive enzymes everywhere that are gonna start destroying all of your own cells. So when a cell is gonna die, it goes through this um, program where it kind of destroys itself and compartmentalizes itself into little vesicles that your other um, like your immune system cells can come in and clean up in a kind of controlled manner rather than just kind of spewing all this toxic stuff everywhere that's going to destroy the surrounding tissue. So apoptosis, this programmed cell death, is, is an important concept. Um, what other thing? The nucleus. What, what do we find in the nucleus? The DNA. Yeah, that's where the DNA is. Um, and you've got about two meters of DNA in every cell, in every single cell in your body. If you took the, the DNA is wound around these things, the histone protein, so it's kind of spooled around in kind of this controlled way. If you took all the DNA in one cell and just unwound it, and held it out as this big double helix, this ladder of you know, ACs and G, you know, ATs and GCs, it would be about six feet long. I mean, I did a calculation once, like given like you've got like your billions of cells in your body, if you took all the DNA in your body and just strung it end to end, it would reach from earth to the sun and back like five times. You got a 
bunch of DNA in your body that is um, got the code to make all the proteins. And more than that, it's also got a lot of areas that are about um, control, about what do we make and when, right? Because except for a few exceptions, like your red blood cells, pretty much all your cells have DNA to make anything, right? And you don't want the cells in your nose to start making digestive enzymes to digest your nose and have your nose dissolve off the front of your face. Or you don't want to have hair starting to grow in the middle of your kidneys and liver, right? You need to make sure that only the parts of the DNA that are relevant for that particular cell are actually being activated. So there's a whole lot of cellular control that also in the nucleus. You know, again, when that goes wrong, that's when you start getting cancer. If your cells start turning on, start dividing when they shouldn't be dividing and things like that. Um, so the nucleus, it's about storing the DNA of information, but it's also about kind of controlling, like, what is the cell doing? When is it doing it? What is it making or not making? Um, so nucleus, what else? Um, centrioles, what do centrioles do? Anybody remember centrioles? Nobody? I think it's like um, part of like the structure of the cell to uphold the structure, like the um, kind of like the skeletal system of the cell. So they're uh, definitely related to that. What particular part of the cytoskeleton are they related to? Is it the nucleus? Say it again. Uh, is it, is, it's near the nucleus, right? Um, this. So these are the things that are the, they're made out of actually little things of microtubules. These are kind of like the little microtubular organizing centers. They're These like are the things that created the spindle during mitosis. During cell division, yeah. Yes. So, so another thing which you should be aware of is the whole cytoskeleton. You know, and a big part of that are microtubules. And we'll see them playing many different roles from kind of making the cilia beat back and forth to, you know, cell division. They're what make the spindle for things to, you know, to pull chromosomes from one side to the other. They're also going to be kind of like railway tracks where you can like be like pulling little vesicles and moving things from one side of a cell to another, particularly a long thing like a neuron that could be like, you know, three feet long. Uh, microtubules are made out of these little subunits. They're like called tubulin subunits. Tubulin. And basically, you can just add more subunits and the thing gets longer or take them away and the thing gets shorter. Um, so these things can grow and retract pretty dynamically. Um, another protein that we see a lot is my, in the cytoskeleton, actin. Actin is also called, what we call microfilaments. These are gonna play an important role when we get obviously into muscle contraction. You've met actin as actin and myosin. But actin is also holding the nucleus in the middle. Like, you know, why does the nucleus stay in the middle of the cell? It's because there's cytoskeleton like anchoring it there. Actin is going to be forming the um, reinforcement of microvilli. So the microvilli stay as little folds to increase surface area and stuff. So microfilaments are going to be important. Then there's a whole bunch of kind of the catch all we call the intermediate filaments. What's going on here? 
enter I know those attached to desmosomes. Yeah, uh, exactly. Cell junction. For it, yeah, exactly. Like this would be like the keratin attached to the desmosomes that are reinforcing your skin, your epidermis or something. So intermediate filaments is kind of like the catch-all for all lots of other stuff. You know, in our class, we'll be focusing mostly, we'll see, we'll see lots of stuff with microtubules, lots of stuff with actin, and just being aware that there's lots of other stuff as well. Um, but, you know, that kind of, and I can't overemphasize that a cell is not just like a bag of organelles. It's not like a Ziploc with goo. You know, there's all sorts of structure in there and things are anchored and things are constantly moving. And even like mitochondria, things that you think are just there. There was this, there's this guy I saw talk um, about a year ago of this guy who's um, worked, his, they, I, I should find some of these movies to show you. They've been able to image living cells now rather than just fixing them and looking them, you know, kind of as a picture, as a dead picture. They've had pictures of what's the cell look like when it's actually still alive and doing its thing. And it is crazy how you, you feel like you're in some Looney Tune cartoon. Everything is moving and undulating and squishing and pinching off and reassembling and getting moved here and there and wiggling like little worms and stuff. Like the inside of a cell is very dynamic. It's definitely this huge, crazy factory that is just going on hyperdrive, you know, doing all the processes that it needs to do to to do what it needs to do what it does. So definitely when you think of a cell, don't just think of one of these plastic models that you've probably seen in your classroom before they, or a picture in your book. When you look at a real cell like in real time, it is just pulsing and seething with activity. Um, okay. So we're going to do now, we are going to spend a lot of time focusing on the cell membrane. You know, the cell membrane is critical because that is the boundary between the inside and the outside. And we've already talked about some of its core properties. What are the core properties what is it made out of mainly? What's its main structural composition? Phospholipids. Yeah, we talked about the phospholipid bilayer. You know, and then there was lots of cholesterol kind of shoved in between the little hydrophobic tails. And then lots of proteins. We talked about that fluid mosaic model. You know, we are probably, we're not even going to make to the end of today. We're still going to be talking about membrane proteins and what they do and all the different functions. You know, for the rest of today, we're probably just going to be focusing mainly on the cell membrane and what's going on there and its properties. Um, so I apologize, I need to make, I need to run and do something really fast. I'm going to be back in like about three minutes, um, but you can chat amongst yourselves. Um, this will, yeah, this will be, so here. Talk amongst yourselves. I'll be back in just a flash. Faith? Yes. Um, I, I went to my old computer, the Mac. So maybe go to systems again, preference. Okay, let's see. Uh, how do I get out of here though? Escape. Um,
And then again, go to security and privacy. Hold on, I still haven't gotten out of this screen. Um, okay, here we go. So, okay, so I'm in system preference. And then go to privacy. And so this is got privacy. And then um, I haven't found privacy though. That's it should show. So this is this is under system preference. Yes. Okay, so I am to be able to see security and privacy. You should be able to see it there next to extensions. And you click there. I am going to, let's see. I'm going to screenshot what it's showing and text it to you. OK. Okay, I'm back. All right, so back to our regularly scheduled program here. Um, all right, so cell membranes. Um, first, I will start with kind of the broader things about cell membranes, just how not all cells look like circles. So let's talk about just some of the specializations and how they're just kind of set up. Sometimes we have microvilli. So again, you've seen this, you've been in anatomy, you've seen this, you've probably seen this in all your other classes. You know, what is the purpose of adding microvilli to a cell? Increased surface area. Exactly. So we're gonna see these in, you know, classic places like in the lining of your intestine where you wanna absorb, really increase absorption of nutrients. We'll see these in the tubules in the kidneys where you want to increase reabsorption as you do all the processing. Um, these do not move. They're not motile. They are purely for increasing surface area, right? If you just take, you know, I have this thing, it's this long. But then if I just fold it into a, like all sorts of little folds, it has the same surface area, but it's just taking way less room, right? So these have actin to help them hold their shape. 
right? If you took a piece of cloth and you just made it all pleated up and you let go, the pleats would fall out. So this needs to have cytoskeletal elements that help hold the structure. Um, these are only visible like under a um, electron microscope, you know, under light microscope, they actually just kind of look, you know, in fact, when we get to the intestines, we'll talk about the brush border. Brush border, because the reality, it doesn't look like individual things. It just looks kind of like, you know, it's clear. It's not just a smooth boundary, but it looks more like the edge of a brush, like of a paintbrush or something. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and there is something called stereocilia, which is kind of like super long microvilli. We'll, we'll only see one example of that later when we get to the um, ear, but let's forget about that for now. The other big thing you should know about our cilia and these are motile. They move. These are for kind of sweeping things along. You know, these are in your fallopian tubes to move the egg along from the ovaries towards the uterus. These are in your, um, in your respiratory passages to sweep the mucus that catches the dust to the back of your throat. So the cilia are wiggling back and forth. And if I do a cross section of one of these, so these are, these are filled with microtubules. At the base of them, they have these little basal bodies that the microtubules spring from. And if I look inside, We saw with nine plus two arrangement of microtubules. So the basic idea here is you've got these microtubules and here's this cilia. There's microtubules and the microtubules have these little proteins, they're called dynins. You know, dynin, dynamic, makes motion. And it pulls on one side with respect to the other side. In fact, I can show this to you. Yeah, this will work. Um, so imagine, again, imagine, I'm going to stop sharing here for a moment. All right, so what I have here, in fact, let me show you here. So this is, I think I'm gonna have to, let me stop. I need to turn off my virtual background for you to see this correctly. So here I have, this is the top of a Ziploc. Um, and I am putting them kind of interleaved. So they're kind of next to each other, but they can slide with respect to each other. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my fingers to kind of make them move. They're still kind of holding on, but they're gonna be sliding, pulled with each other. And you see what happens? You know, if I take these two microtubules that are side by side and use these little dynin proteins to kind of pull them with respect to each other, the whole shebang just starts waving back and forth, right? So that's kind of how, that's how your microtubules work. Not micro, that's how the cilia work with the microtubule cytoskeleton. Um, that's how the tail of a sperm swims. A, a flagellum is just a big, long structure that's built the same way, except instead of wiggling to sweep something over the surface of the cell, 
the flagellum on a sperm is there to actually propel the whole cell and swim on towards the egg. But it's the same basic idea, microtubules side by side with the little dynein proteins that wiggle them back and forth. Um, and then I usually, I usually tell people this like other thing, things you learn in physiology that you might, that be probably more useful in some ways than some of, <laughs> if you take a top of a Ziploc like this, then usually you wanna actually free up the bottom part so it slides easy, but then you can use it like, you usually do like magic stuff. You like, you can like, You know, I hike. Hey, Alistair. Mr. Ziploc, it's nice to see you. Oh, nice to see you too. Wow. You know, it's like. <laughs> so you can like, you can have fun. You can mess around, make up your own stories, but it's actually, it's actually endless fun. Um, all right. Let's continue here. All right. So we talk about the cell membrane now. It can have microvilli, it can have cilia that wiggle. And now what we're going to talk about are a huge array of membrane proteins. The things that are embedded in the membrane that are doing all sorts of important jobs. So what are some of the roles of these membrane proteins? Transport. So a big part is transport. So we might as well just dig in here. We're going to be, we might actually be still talking about transport by the time, time we hit our break. So the basic idea, let's, Let's review again the kind of native properties of the phospholipid bilayer. So here we have our phospholipid bilayer. What can cross this layer without any help at all? Nonpolar. So things that are nonpolar. Things that are nonpolar can drift across without any help. What other kinds of things can cross? Small molecules. So very, like very small. And what kind of molecules? Like water and urea. Yeah, so very small polar molecules. So, but unless you are a lipid or a very super dinky polar molecule, you can't cross the membrane. You can't get out of the cell or into the cell without help. Um, and there are going to be all sorts of proteins that are transport proteins that basically make little tunnels for things to move in and out that normally would not be able to cross. And, and just for completeness, actually, what, what is the one other way to get things in and out of a cell um, that won't cross the membrane that is not using a, a little transport protein like this little channel? If a cell wants to take something in or spit something out. Endo or exocytosis? Yeah, exactly. So let me do that just as an aside endo and exocytosis. Um, right, if I have some cell, 
when there's something it wants to eat, for instance, it can like You know, it just goes and envelops. Them. Remember, because the phospholipid bilayer is only held together by hydrophobic hydrophilic interactions. So as soon as these pinch off, this can just now be its little vesicle inside, and the membrane is still complete here, right? And you could run it backwards too for exocytosis. If you have something that you have inside that you want to release, like some kind of secretion or a hormone or whatever, some enzymes, digestive enzymes, you can make it inside and then re do this in reverse and spit things out. So you can either take things in or spit things out. Endocytosis is to take it in, exocytosis is to spit it out. Um, I should mention that the parts of the membrane that are involved with this aren't just random. And this doesn't happen just randomly, right? This takes a lot of energy. This is active transport. You know, the cell needs to have, there's all sorts of cytoskeleton things pushing and pulling to make the membrane move, right? Think the membrane doesn't, the membrane's just like basically grease. So there's all sorts of active stuff going on with the cytoskeleton pushing and pulling. Um, the parts of the membrane that are involved with this tends to have this stuff called clathrin. In fact, we call this often a clathrin coated pit. It's not just random part of the membrane. This part of the membrane is specialized for endocytosis. And the clathrin actually locks and reinforces the vesicle. So once the vesicle is pinched off, the clathrin locks in this really cool, um, kind of triple symmetry cage that goes around the whole thing and stabilizes it and holds it as a, as a um, structurally sound little package. Um, so just to make you think about endocytosis, exocytosis a little more, um, a little deeper, it's not just kind of magic. You know, it's actually being operated by all sorts of machinery in the cell and special membrane proteins that help stabilize the vesicles and everything. So, you know, actually clathrin is another membrane protein that helps, you know, with endo and exocytosis and stabilizing these internal vesicles. At some point, maybe after the break, I'll show you some pictures of them. They're, they're kind of beautiful the way they all interlock with each other. Um, and the other thing I should mention about endo and exocytosis, it's not just about taking things into the cell or taking things out of the cell. It can also be about changing the membrane properties really quickly. Like, you know, for instance, I might have a cell, you know, in my kidney tubules, and maybe it has these channels that allow certain things to go in and out of the cell. And I want all of a sudden the cell not to have those channels in the membrane. I can just pinch those off inside. My apologies. I couldn't hear what you said. Look. So you do this endocytosis. You know, pinch them off. All of a sudden, the cell has no permeability, no channels. And this happens like in a fraction of a second. And now let's say I want them back. All I do is the opposite. I take this little vesicle and I fuse it here and by golly, they're there again. So I can add and subtract like channels and carriers to the membrane like in fractions of a second by just fusing or pinching off these little vesicles that contain those membrane proteins. So endo and exocytosis isn't just about eating and spitting out. It's also about just quickly and easily changing the proteins that are found in the membrane and therefore the properties of the membrane. So it's kind of cool.
All right. But now let's talk more about transport. All right. So these are going to be incredibly important as we go through the semester. The little proteins that are found here's like my cell. And these little things that allow specific things to move in and out of the cell. And there's a whole bunch of different versions of them. So let's just kind of get started here. Um, let's start with channels. usually for a particular kind of ion. You know, some channels will be like, you know, you know, for example, you know, we'll have potassium channels, sodium channels, calcium channels. Sometimes you have, um, you know, it'll be chloride channels Sometimes they're more about the qualities. You can have the, you know, divalent cation channels that will let calcium or magnesium through. Or sometimes you also have just what we call leak channels that just let anything through. Um, but in general, when we talk about channels, we'll be talking about ones that are specialized, just will let potassium or just let sodium or just let calcium or just let chloride through. So, these channels will let an ion cross the membrane, typically, again, like I said, a particular kind of ion. Sometimes they are just open and they just let things move in and out just depending on their concentration gradient. But they are often gated. Gated meaning that there is a gate. It's like if the gate is closed, nothing goes through. And if the gate is open, then you know, here stuff comes in and out. If the gate is closed, things can't move in and out. So the gate back. Ah! The gate can be closed or the gate can be open. And what kind of things control gated channels? There's a few different things that will, you know, that can control a gated channel. ATP? No. You know, ATP is going to be used, uh, you know, at some of these transport proteins to pump things against their gradient and all that. But it's that they're not ATP won't be actually opening or closing a channel. Won't be, you know, closing the gate or opening the gate. Is it signaling molecules like? Yeah. Like yeah. So, Chris, everybody here, Chris, a, a big part, a big way you can do it are signaling molecules. What we call ligand gated. Ligand is just a fancy word for a signaling molecule. So in a ligand gated channel, you know, there is some little dock. And if nothing's in the dock, the gate is closed. And If you get the special, the ligand fits in there. 
Then the gate opens and now things can move in and out. So ligand gated means there's some molecule that fits kind of like a lock and key. And if the ligand is, in, in fact, and this is bind, what we call binding. I was going to say substrate um, with that. Are they like the same thing? So it's similar in that you have a light, you have a molecule binding a specific site like a lock and a key, but it's a little different because a substrate is something that an enzyme is going to work on and do a chemical reaction on. The ligand is not being acted on. It's just like a key. It's like the key in a lock. So, but a substrate is more like taking like an egg and breaking it into a bowl and turning it into a cake or something. Like it's fundamentally changed. The substrate is, is worked on. So, so that's, it's, you know, let's make sure we're clear about that. Enzymes. You have like, here's my enzyme. Here's some substrate. And there is binding. But it's the substrate binding the active site in my enzyme. And then the enzyme does some kind of reaction that deals with my substrate. So this is working, this is metabolism. Over here, this is like a key to open a lock. You know, the key goes in, you unlock it, something happens, but then, you know, the key is not destroyed. The key isn't digested. The key isn't broken apart or whatever. The key is now just goes off and is waiting to unlock another door someplace. So they're related in this way that you have something that fits and binds, but they're also different as well. Okay, I think I got confused because in the textbook, it says ligands that bind to enzymes and membrane, membrane transporters are also called substrates. Well, I will take a look. So that, I think that's an unfortunate way for her to say that. Okay, it's on page 50. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at that. I mean, she, I, I don't doubt she said that, but I, I think that's confusing to think of it that way. I will take a look. Um, so ligand is a signaling molecule. It's binding. And I should mention this binding, this is kind of some temporary, right? It goes in, something happens, but after a while, there's just the temperature and then it breaks off and now it's floating around on its own again, right? If it's stuck in there and never let go, it would be like you broke the key off in the lock and now the lock is useless. Nobody else can open or close it anymore. So when we, we're gonna talk a lot more about this binding We'll spend, we'll and it's going to involve the side chains on amino acids, and it's going to involve ionic bonding and hydrogen bonding and nonpolar interactions. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about exactly what does it mean for a ligand to bind like this. Um, so this is an important way. This is like how neurotransmitters can affect your, your neurons, right? Let's say this is you know, serotonin or acetylcholine or something. And now it can open up channels and now ions can move back and forth and create electrical signals as the charge moves in and out of the cell, right? So this is how a, this is how a nervous, how nerve, how nerve messages get transmitted from one neuron to another. There's gonna be a ligand, some neurotransmitter binding and opening up these channels that allow ions to move, which is the electrical signal in a body. So this is gonna be super critical when we just look at how the nervous system works.
Um, and we'll see some, some channels are directly gated where they actually have the little receptor site on the channel itself. Although most of the time it's gonna be a little more complicated. We're gonna get into the whole thing of second messenger mediated signal transduction um, later this week. Um, so sometimes the step from ligand to opening the channel is a little more involved. So we'll, we'll, we'll be following all that. All right, so a back to, so as we said, often they are gated and they can be curled by signaling molecules, which we're gonna call ligand gated. What's another thing that can control whether or not a channel opens or closes? Okay, I'll help you out. So sometimes the channel is closed and what is gonna open it is just a physical deformation of the cell, kind of stretching the cell. And that opens a channel. You know, this is how touch receptors work, right? What is touch? Touch, you're physically deforming your skin and all of a sudden there's an electrical signal that goes to your nervous system that you interpret as touch. Um, this is even how hearing works. You know, what is hearing? My voice is vibrations that are vibrating your eardrum. That vibration of your eardrum is ultimately bending a cell and that bending of the cell is opening and closing mechanically gated channels, which are letting ions cross the membrane and creating electrical signals that you interpret as sound. Um, so mechanically gated are gonna be important for all these like sense of touch. For how does your stomach, you, how, I'm really full, my stomach is all stretched out. How do I know my stomach is stretched out? Because as your stomach stretches out, channels are gonna open up in the cells and create electrical signals as these ions move that tell your brain that your stomach is stretched out. So, Stretch receptors, mechanically gated channels are important in, in your body. And finally, there's one more. Voltage gated. Exactly, voltage gated. Um, which you can't really read there. Let me go to a new page. So voltage gated, for this to make sense, we need to define what is volt the voltage across the membrane. So let's talk about membrane potential or membrane voltage. So, and in fact, the Symbol for voltage sometimes is V, sometimes we use E for like electrical potential or electromotive force. So a lot of times the voltage is represented by the letter E and you're wondering why is it in the E? Um, so this gets, this is created by separation of charge. 
So let me kind of show you how this works. So imagine a cell that's just kind of at rest and it's got ions in it. It's got cations and there's cations outside, you know, cations. Um, what are examples of cations? Sodium. Yeah, sodium, potassium, calcium, things like that. Um, and there's anions like chloride. So assuming that it's kind of balanced, there's the same number of plus and minus inside and outside. Then if I take, let's say I have my little cation thing here. Wait. Hold on a sec. Trying to be clever. Here we go. So here's my little ion. It doesn't necessarily want to be going into the cell or out of the cell because there's, you know, in general, positive charges like to go where? Towards what? Negative. Yeah, opposites attract. It would rather go away from the positive towards the negative, but it's just as positive or negative inside versus outside. So there is no electrical potential here. This thing here, we'd say there's zero voltage across the membrane. So in this case here, we talk about V sub M the membrane voltage or membrane potential. There's zero in this case that I've drawn here. But now what happens if I start moving? Let's say I'm gonna take a bunch of these guys from the inside and move them outside. And now all of a sudden it's more positive outside than inside. I would say that this has, you know, the membrane voltage is always um, written as the inside with respect to outside. Inside cell. So I would say right now, because the inside is more negative than the outside, this cell now has a negative membrane voltage because I have, it's more negative inside than outside. And now if I look at my little cation here, which way does it wanna go? To the side that's more negative, so inside. Exactly. So that this is the this is the critical thing. I'm gonna say wants to move in. Right. I mean, I because we're not in an actual chemistry or physics class, I get to be a little more fast and loose and personify these things, right? An ion doesn't want anything. It's just some, you know, atom. Um, but you can think that it wants it. I want to go where it's more negative. So there is this electrical potential that is going to drive the movement of a cation into the cell. So that's what this voltage is like. And I, if I had it the opposite, if it was more positive inside versus outside, this thing would wanna leave. And notice this is different than diffusion forces. We're gonna actually see chemical forces that are gonna also be happening at the same time and might actually be opposing the electrical force. 
right? Because, you know, ions also, if I had, depending on how many potassiums are inside versus outside, they're going to, going to want to move depending on their diffusion gradient, but then they also can want to move based on the electrical gradient. So this is going to be really important when we start looking at the resting potential of cells next class. Um, but for right now, we're just kind of talking about electrical potential or voltage is just by definition, this charge imbalance created by the separation of charge, one side is more negative or positive. And depending on the voltage, that can actually trigger the opening of a channel. Most cells tend to have a membrane of resting voltage around minus 70 millivolts. And when it gets above minus 55, voltage gated channels open. We're gonna be looking at that in lots more detail as this semester goes on. But for right now, I just wanna define voltage. Don't worry about the details about how it all links in beyond just knowing like, Oh, as the voltage changes, sometimes that's what triggers the opening of a channel. Um, while we're at ligand gated, let me um, introduce a few terms that will be useful here. So any questions about this? There's these three kinds of channels or th three kinds of gated channels. They can open based on signaling molecules being there to unlock they can be based on just physical deformation of the cell membrane stretching, or it can be changes in voltage, whether it's more positive or negative inside compared to outside. And has that changes, that can be the trigger for a channel opening or closing. Okay. So channels, things that let ions cross and often gated. Now we're gonna talk about carriers. Um, carriers are a little more complicated. Um, these are usually for larger molecules. You know, for instance, like glucose amino acids. And they tend to be more kind of, of a complex method to get over through the membrane. So whereas a channel really is kind of like a tunnel, a carrier is more like a revolving door. So this glucose comes here, but then there is all sorts of like chick, chick, click, 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 and then spits it out the other side. Right, things still move according to their concentration gradient, but it's more complicated. It's not just moving through an open doorway. Like in most, has everybody here experienced a revolving door. If you just tried to run through a revolving door, you'd whack your face in it, right? You have to go in and then you gotta go around and rotate and revolve and end up on the other side. You'll get where you're going, but you have to be a little more conscientious about how you do it. So carriers, the reason why we care if it's a carrier, huh? is about the, the rate of diffusion, how things can move across the membrane if it's just with channels or with carriers. Um, yeah, let me, let me finish with this and then we'll take a break. So if you think about diffusion, and we're going to spend so much time talking about diffusion, but in general, if I have some channel, some open doorway, 
from one side to the other. And there's a bunch of stuff on one side and not much on the other. Which way does this, does it, my stuff want to move due to diffusion? The side on the left. Yeah, so it's driven by the concentration gradient, right? Concentration gradient. the difference between the two sides. And in general, if you look at the rate of diffusion, if there's no gradient at all, if both sides are completely the same, then there's no diffusion, nothing moves. But in general, the stronger, the, the larger the gradient, the more the difference is between the two sides, the faster things move across from one side to the other due to diffusion. So this is normal diffusion. Normal diffusion the higher the concentration gradient, meaning the larger the difference between the two sides, the faster things move. But if we have a carrier with this kind of complicated revolving door thing, you know, it doesn't matter how many things are here waiting to get from this side to that side, there's some maximum rate this thing can work. You know, if you try to get like tons of people through a revolving door all at once, it doesn't work. You got to wait for each person to make it through the revolving door and get their other side and then the next person goes. So when we look at this graph here, if I am using, if, if using carriers, It'll start like this, but then it just hits some max. Right? It doesn't matter how big the concentration gradient is, there is this limit to how fast things can go across the carrier across the across the membrane using a carrier. Um, this is what we're going to call facilitated diffusion. So this is still passive transport. This is facilitated, facilitated. Hold on, let me not confuse you by spazzing on you. Facilitated. So facilitated diffusion, if we're using carriers here, there's a maximum rate that things can cross. This is going to be important. This is going to come back later as we go through the semester. It's, it's why you get sugar in your urine if you have diabetes mellitus because there's this maximum rate that your tubules are gonna reclaim sugar from the filtrate, you know, and it's because the whole process is using carriers and carriers have some maximum rate that they can take stuff back, you know, across the membranes. So it is gonna matter. It is gonna matter whether or not things are crossing the membrane using channels, in which case we don't, the rate is whatever is defined by the gradient or if we have carriers and we have this facilitated diffusion, still driven by the concentration gradient, but maxed out in terms of how fast things can cross. Uh, is th does that make sense? Okay. Um,